Here's our first of a number of examples that we're going to add to our repertoire of what we call light refraction and Snell slot types of videos. Now, what is light refraction? When it, whenever light crosses a boundary, it tends to bend or change direction. So for example, if there's a boundary between, let's say, uh, uh, air and water, and well, actually, you know, I think I want to turn that around because air, water is not going to be floating. So let's, let's do it like this, air on top and water on the bottom. And let's say that a beam of light enters the water from the air. It will cross a boundary, like so. And uh, that means that it's going to bend or refract, as we call it. And in this case, when we go from a smaller index refraction to a larger index refraction, because the index of refraction of air is equal to one, and the index of refraction of water is equal to about 1.33. And I call it sub 1 and sub 2 because I always like to go say that we go from 1 to 2. We then find that the angle of incidence, theta sub i, and then this would be the angle of refraction, theta sub r. Notice that the two angles are not going to be equal to each other. And it turned out that Snell found an equation that relates those two angles to one another, where he said that n1 times the sine of theta 1 equals n2 times the sine of theta 2. If we call this angle theta 2, and we call this angle theta 1, now we have a nice relationship between the angles and the index of refraction. So this is known as Snell's law. And we need that to calculate the angle of refraction, the angle or the direction of the beam that just crossed the boundary compared to the beam that just entered the boundary like that. So we also find that when a ray goes from a larger index refraction to a smaller index refraction, so let's say somebody is underneath the water and shines a beam of light again towards the boundary, if the angle of incidence, this angle right here, if this angle is too large, instead of crossing the boundary, because in case of going from a high index refraction to a low index refraction, the beam will actually refract or bend away from the normal, and you can see that if this angle becomes too large, this angle becomes larger, and eventually, instead of leaving the medium, the, the beam will simply reflect inside the medium and not leave the medium. So that's called total internal reflection. That's a principle that we experience in what we call a fiber optic cable. A fiber optic cable, which is made out of a type of glass, uh, will allow beams of light to travel through the cable without actually leaving the cable, even if the cable is bent, because typically the angle of incidence is so large that it's greater that than what we call the critical angle. This is what we call the critical angle. If the angle is greater than the critical angle, it will not leave the medium but stay in, and so a beam of light can simply ricochet back and forth against the inside of the fiber optic cable and travel for thousands of miles if the cable is that long without ever leaving the cable. So what we were trying to find out here is what is the maximum angle between two rays from a particular point in the middle of the cable towards the edge of the cable that these two rays of light can make and still remain inside the fiber optic cable without leaving the fiber optic cable. All right, the way to do that is to find out what the critical angle is right here. So this is called the critical angles. That's theta sub c, the critical angle. And the way we can find that critical angle is by using Snell's law. So we use the very same law. We say, well, n1 times the sine of theta1. So 1 is the region inside the fiber optic cable. 2 is the region outside the fiber optic cable. Let's say that outside the fiber optic cable we have air. In the fiber optic cable we have glass. Index of refraction for glass 1.56. For air, 1. And so it's n1 sine of theta1 equals n2 sine of theta2. The way we find the critical angle is by increasing this angle to the point until this angle right here, this angle right here, becomes a 90 degree angle. At that point, the light will no longer leave the medium. It'll skim along the edge, and if we make the angle any bigger than that, it will simply reflect back inside the medium. So to find the critical angle, we set the exiting angle equal to 90 degrees. That would be theta sub 2. So we have n1 sine of the critical angle, which is the angle right here, is equal to n2 times the sine of 90 degrees. And of course, the sine of 90 degrees is equal to 1. So that can be replaced by 1, which means that we can now write the sine of the critical angle is equal to n2 divided by n1. Or the critical angle can be found by taking the arc sine 
of this ratio of n2 divided by n1. All right, so this would be equal to the arc sine of n2 is uh, where we're going to. That would be 1 divided by n1. This is where we came from. It's 1.56, and it's 39.87, about 39.9 degrees. So the critical angle is equal to 30, what did I say it was? 39.9 degrees. All right. Okay, so that means that this angle here is 39.9 degrees. If we go across here, that means this angle here must be 39.9 degrees because that's also the critical angle, which means that this now forms a triangle with two times, two angles equal to 39.9 degrees in the angle that we're looking for. So we can then say that 180 degrees minus one of the critical angles, 39.9 degrees, minus the other angle, 39.9 degrees, which is equal to 180 degrees minus, when you add those two together, you get 79.8 degrees, which is equal to 100.2 degrees, which means the largest angle that you can have here, that's the maximum angle, is 100.2 degrees of two diverging beams of light. If there are any if that angle becomes any larger, the beams will not stay inside a fiber optic cable. They'll actually leave the fiber optic cable, and the transmission will no longer continue. As long as the angle is less than that, the rays will just continue to bounce back and forth all the way through the fiber optic cable. And that's how we do that.